You wanted to sue me. And I did sue you. That's where all this is leading. And I didn't have enough money to defend myself. But people gave it to you. People felt sorry for you and gave it to you. People who hated me gave it to you. People who hated you gave it to you because they hated me more. <laughs> Nora Ephron is here over the past decade. She has become one of the most influential women in Hollywood. She began her career as a journalist and an essayist. She then turned to screenwriting with such films as Heartburn and Silkwood. She wrote and directed the blockbuster film Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail. In December, she had a new title to her resume, Broadway Playwright. Her first play is called Imaginary Friends and focuses on the legendary feud between Mary McCarthy and Lillian Hellman. I am pleased to have her back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. Now, what brought you to do this? I mean, were you sitting at home saying, I've got nothing to do. Why don't I write a play? No, but I'd always wanted to write a play. I mean, who doesn't want to write a play? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> well, I just have always wanted to, but I and I because went, you are of New York, of well, because I love to go to plays and I love plays and I love how you feel when you're at a play that you like and and you love to write and I like to write. I do and and actually for many years the actor studio used to have a program for um, writers who were not necessarily playwrights. Right who could come week after week and the idea was that maybe it would inspire you to write a play so i went week after week and it was it was the opposite of that because week after week some playwright in the group would have a little table read of his play and then all the people there would trash it and harold broadkey do you remember no, harold sure broad I do. yeah he was, he was in the group, and he always, it did not matter what the play was about, he always accused the playwright of being anti-Semitic. <laughs> yes. So I would go week after weekend, and I, I kept thinking, I'm not getting an idea for a play, except that I did think maybe I could do a play that took place at the actor's studio with a character not unlike Harold Brodkey in it, but that didn't get me too far. <laughs> yes. But the point a play is, about play I have always wanted to write a play, I just didn't know if one was ever going to smack into me. But and did, did you at, at some point say, okay, I want to write a play, I've always wanted to write a play, I'm going to go in search of... No, what happened is that I got interested in writing about Mary McCarthy and Lillian Hellman and this devastating collision that happened to both of them at the end of each of their lives when Mary McCarthy famously went on the Dick Cavett show <laughs> yes. and said of Lillian Hellman every word she writes is a lie including and and the which is <laughs> yes. which is of course one of the great witty vicious remarks ever uttered and for which Mary McCarthy almost literally paid with her life because Lillian Hellman sued her immediately for over two million dollars which was about A 20 or 30 today, times right. the <laughs> amount of money Mary McCarthy had and 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 really really um, shortened her life. All right. Now how did this almost destroy Mary McCarthy? Well many many people have no appetite for being sued. In comfort then, yes. And and for being sued for so much more money than than she actually had. Lillian, on the other hand, loved litigation. She was a she was a real scrapper. And you know, one of Lillian always used to talk about her anger as if it were this sort of fabulous pet that she brought <laughs> along to the table. And I think Lillian had enough money and had a lot of free legal advice in, in that period. So she was able to do this. And I think it just destroyed Mary McCarthy's health. I think it scared her to death. Tell me who, at this time, these two people were. And well, what did they represent in terms of the literary world? Well, Lillian Hellman was probably the most famous woman playwright. That's the way she was always identified. But she was a very famous playwright, take the gender right. out of it, who had written a number of huge hits, including The Children's Hour and The Little Foxes. And then, of course, as a kind of fantastic third act, gave up writing plays began to write memoirs, and they became bestsellers, won the National Book Award, and one of them, the chapter in one of them called Julia, 
was made into a movie with Jane Fonda, and it was this story Lillian wrote in her memoirs about how she had brought all this money behind the lines prior to World right. War II and saved people from Did Hitler. Did Herb Ross direct that? Who directed that? Uh, Fred Zinneman. Fred Zinneman. Right. Fred Zinneman. Yeah. And everybody believed every word of that piece. I certainly did. When I read it, I was just overwhelmed. And everyone was. Every, no, it didn't cross anyone's mind, although it did cross someone's mind. It crossed Mary McCarthy's <laughs> mind, I assure you. But it did not cross my mind that Lillian had essentially fabricated the entire thing. How could someone with her reputation fabricate something? Well, I don't know. But she was a liar in some way that you could either say she was a great storyteller, she was a dramatist, or you could be mean and you could say she was a liar. She had this story kicking around. She'd used part of it in Watch on the Rhine. Then she wrote a play that didn't quite work using part of it, and then she kind of recycled it into this thing in her memoirs. And if you wanted to look at it in a, in a kind of Hmm, well, maybe way. You think, well, maybe she had no idea that people would take it so literally and it would become a movie and, and Vanessa Redgrave would play the part of, of the poor, tragic Julia, etc. But the thing is, I knew Lillian Hellman and she talked about Julia all the time. It wasn't so like... So she'd come to believe it, perhaps, in her own mind? I don't know, because that's the thing about liars, real liars. <laughs> yes, that right. pathology is not necessarily ex accessible to the right. rest of us, those of us who merely exaggerate the number of minutes we have been waiting for loved ones in front of the movie theater, <laughs> can't quite get into what that is like. <laughs> real liars. Uh, Mary McCarthy, on, on the other, other hand, hand, was a very, very, very brilliant critic and novelist. She was a great critic, and, and she and Lillian Hellman had both become wildly famous at the exact same age of 29. Both of them, it, and in a period where not that many women were famous, so there's no question that they knew about one another from the beginning, and strangely enough, loathed one another from the beginning, even though they barely knew one another. In all that you have done, do you have a favorite among the two of them? No, I don't. In the end, I ended up kind of, kind of oh, loving both on. of you them. You just no, understood no. them. No, and therefore I'm not you... saying that, because I think they're, the, what's so wonderful about them, from my point of view, from the person who gets to come in and, and deal with these great lives they led that just keep delivering and delivering to you but but what's what what's really great about them is that they're both right and they're both wrong so that is so delicious and neither one of them is more likable than the other well i think i don't think i would have liked mary as much as i like lillian because I, because lillian was fun Lillian was she just was fun. plain fun. Was she fun. wittier and... Well, she was more. just... She was yeah. great. She was fun to be around. I don't think Mary was as much fun as Lillian. When I did, just don't. When did Dashiell Hammett come into her life? Into Lillian's yes. life? When she was about um, 26 or 7. She met him in Hollywood. She was a reader for MGM. And she went to a party and met him. And that was the end of her marriage. And, um, <laughs> and the beginning a of... The beginning of a relationship that we honestly don't have a clue about because like everything Lillian, we have only Lillian almost <laughs> as a source for, we don't yes. quite know what happened. So now you have these two characters. So you yeah. say, I'm going to write a play about their relationship. Yes. So what do you do then? Well, the minute I thought of it as a play, because once I sort of thought this would be interesting, but what is it? Is it a television series that lasts for six parts and you kind of parallel lives or something like that. It certainly couldn't be a movie because who's going to make a movie about two women in their 70s? No one that I know. <laughs> and you ought to know. <laughs> but, but then someone said to me, could it be a play? And the minute they said that, I thought, oh, of course, because I had seen Copenhagen and I had seen Invention of Love, both right. of them in London. And, and I saw them in the same week. And it was very interesting to me because both of them take place 
after people are dead, and right. both of them are about trying to figure out what happened, and both of them are about how limited one's knowledge is of what actually happened in real life. So you went to school on Copenhagen? I think I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, the minute I thought of it, I thought, oh, I know, I know where they are. They're in a ladies' room in hell. <laughs> <laughs> and they're stuck there with one another. And so they got to tell their stories. Yeah. And so what's hard? You've got your story. You've got your characters. And you've even got your, you've got your technique. You know what to do. What, then you just write. Well, I went to see a couple of things. In fact, I went to see this play about Mae West called Dirty Blonde. Yeah. And um, which was a sort of biographical play. And I loved it. That Claudia Shear and James Yeah, LeBron exactly. Right, right. And... And there was some music in it, so I thought, oh, music, that's an idea. So I threw a little, a few ideas for songs in, because I thought yeah. that would sort of break things up. Are you going to write another play? I mean, are, is, your, is your appetite for playwriting still there? Oh, sure, because it's, some, it's great. The mm -hmm. theater is great. Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea mm -hmm. that it would be. It, this is a question I know that you've been asked a thousand times, so I have no pride of authorship. How is it different than writing a screenplay? different from writing well I don't think the writing process is that different except that of course for the most part screenplays have to take place in some sort of reality right, right. the great thing about a play is that you can you can jump around you can you can be very abstract you don't you don't have to worry at all about where you are I mean where are we in this play where where wherever they are, are right they now right. you know that you can't do at all in a movie so in in some way it's very freeing and in some ways of course it isn't at all it's just a different thing it's a different muscle when Pentimento came out what'd you think you reviewed it no I didn't review it that's when I met Lillian no oh, that's when you met her I was besotted with this book besotted Absolutely. In fact, I now, having reread it, it just makes me <laughs> laugh at myself because... You were so there's, besotted. Well, there's a, there's a chapter in it called Turtle that yeah. we ran in Esquire magazine, and I was an editor at Esquire at the time, and it is so obviously fabricated yeah. that you can't believe it, and it's all about this turtle that right. she and Hammett caught, and they cut the turtle's head off, but it somehow <laughs> managed to crawl away and resurrect itself as, as I don't even know what, Jesus or something. But in any case, um, the thing I remember about it is that they had a giant fight about what should be done with the body of the turtle, because right. eventually the turtle did die once and for all. And they didn't speak to one another for three or four days. And I remember... Oh, well, yes, and and I remember reading this and thinking, oh, this is the most romantic thing I have ever read. <laughs> now, you know, it's sort of the way you feel when you reread The Great Gatsby, yeah. and you and you can't imagine what you thought when what you were thinking when you read it at twenty one, and and were so. I don't, I don't mean it isn't a great book. Gatsby's always right. great whenever you read it, but but you the first time you read it, it's more romantic right, exactly, right. than it ever is again, and that's. That's how I felt about the story. So I wanted desperately to meet her, and I, and I pitched an interview about her to the New York Times, and they gave me the assignment. So I went and met Lillian Hellman. And were you disappointed? No. Oh, my God, no. Oh, no, because she was so much fun. And I went up to Martha's Vineyard to meet her. She was in her summer residence. And, and I will never forget, at the end of the day, I had gone down to the beach to read a book, and she had, you know, the way people have their own little horrible yeah. beaches on Martha's Vineyard, <laughs> and and I was down there reading a book, and some guy came along and said hello, and I kind of said hello, and we didn't strike up a conversation. So I came back to the house, and she said, how was the beach? And I said, fine. And she said, was there anyone there? And I said, oh, this man came by. She said, what did he look like? And I said, well, whatever. And she said, that does it. I have told him to stay off my beach. And she went, she must have been, well, of course, the truth is she was, as we say, only 68. Yeah. She, she was not <laughs> much <laughs> older than I am now, but she looked 100. Yeah, she really right. did. And she went tearing Leathery. down to that beach to have a fight with that man. And 
I remember thinking that she was a compulsive dramatist, that in a way that most of the rest, most of us who would rather do anything than get into a fight with you, but she was under a compulsion to bring stories to a head. Right. And I almost think that was more of a factor in her ability as a storyteller than anything. She just loved to not let well enough alone. And it also made her litigious. Yes, absolutely. There's a point in the play where, where they, they speculate whether they could ever be friends. Yes, was there ever a moment we could have been friends? They ask themselves that. And? Hard to imagine, as one of them replies. I mean, the truth is that they they had so many reasons to dislike one another. Good reasons, not and uh, beyond the, the Cabot show and one yes, calling the and other beyond, line. Yes, and beyond. You know, when you ask people who knew them, what what do you think it was about? One of the things that's so fascinating to me is that everyone says something different because because they really are a kind of uh, Rorschach for people and and. You know, there are people who will tell you that they were jealous of one another, and there are people who, who are very political who will tell you it's the politics. Um, my own pet theory, my favorite theory to play with, although all of those things are true. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, one of them really was a critic, and the other really was a dramatist, and those are just two wildly different animals. Mm. But they did both sleep with the same guy in around the same time period and and the point of that is i think that was the beginning of it all <laughs> i think that was the start now, did anybody of the ever trouble. say that or write that or no one has said it except i'd say a little bit of it in the play yeah so um so you really tried to understand in writing the play understand what this was about yes and and and, and speculate all the permutations that might have come out of it. Yes, exactly. All right, take, I want to take a look at, this is a scene from the play where Lillian and Mary argue about who wrote fact and who wrote fiction. Here it is. What about ambition? What about vanity? What, what about how pleased you had to have been that this brilliant man had chosen you? Or, or did you think it was only because you were a princess among the trolls? I didn't write that about myself. I wrote it about a character in a short story. It was fiction. Ha! Yes, it was. You wrote fact and called it fiction. And you wrote fiction and called it fact. Oh, 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 that is so painful. <laughs> Was there ever a moment we could have been friends? Hard to imagine. So let's talk about casting. Yes, aren't I lucky? Aren't you lucky? Yeah. Two great. Swissy Kurtz and Terry Jones. Great sort of top of the theatrical community performers. Well, Cherry Jones looks... Who plays Lillian? Who, who plays Mary. Who plays Mary, I'm sorry. Looks shockingly like Mary McCarthy. Yeah. Um, and, of course, won the Tony for the heiress and, and is so brilliant in this. Swoosie, who doesn't look at all like Lillian Hellman, but manages somehow to channel some spirit of Lillian in this performance and is, of course, one of the funniest women alive. Were you concerned about the fact that there was no, by any stretch of the imagination, physical resemblance? Well, there isn't. There's a small stretch of the imagination because both Lillian and Susie are small. Were. Yeah. Lillian was small about 5'2", and Susie's a little bit taller than that. Um, but no, I think when you have actors of this caliber, you kind of know that they're going to they're going to make that work. That that becomes kind of the least of it, I think. What don't you like about this theatrical experience of yours? What don't I like? Yeah. Oh, I think the theater is very exciting. The thing that was the biggest shock to me when we were first doing this in San Diego is a thing that I will say to you and you'll go, well, of course, but it was very shocking to me when you realize that it's different every night. Of course it is. I know, of course it is, but <laughs> oh my God. It's a different time and a different audience and, and the, the players operate from different behavioral but you know, conduct mostly of the day. when you go see a play, you see it only once. <laughs> yes, that's when true. When it's your play, Unless you see Unless you're the playwright, it, you've seen yes, it 150 times. Yes, and every times. so often you go see a play and yeah. then you see the 
people in it afterwards and they go, oh, it was a bad night or it was a good night. And you don't have any sense of what that is because you were there only one night. It is quite amazing to see what happens with the actors and the audience. And there's a certain amount of, of involvement of the audience in this play because each of them is trying to win the audience over to her side. So there's, when we have a, a kind uh -huh. of, you know. So, and so part of the attraction of this play is that there's a com competition for the audience. That's, yes. I mean, th this is their last stand. This is the chance they Mon never had whatever the, to Whatever win, the equivalent of mano mano is. Yeah. What is the equivalent of mano mano? Well, dance of death is what it really <laughs> is. Yeah. Did you talk to, for example, Mike Nichols? Yes. Before you did this? I talked to him after I wrote it. I sent it to him, actually, um, because he was very close. Because he's been there. Well, he's a, he's a friend of mine, and, yeah. and of course, he was a very close friend of Lily. Right. She, in fact, dedicated Pentimento to him. Right. And I sent it to him. And it's he sent it to Jack O'Brien, who directed it. He, he is the person who called Jack and said, I have something I think you might want to do. And Jack read it and said, Nora, I'm yours? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what else did Mike tell you about this? About the experience, about doing it, about, I mean, was that... Well, he didn't tell me anything because he knew, he'd, he'd given me this great present, which was the chance to work with Jack. Mm -hmm. So, well, Does the audience each night, do you sense that they come away with a different, in other words, will tonight's audience be different in their reaction to the two characters and last night's audience? Yes. Yes, they will be, but now I don't know how. That yeah. Well, that's the thing you don't know. All you know is that you know almost from the beginning, two minutes into the play, you know what, whether the audience is here or here. You know two minutes into the play oh, whether even it's going to be... Time, even whether they're going to be with Mary or whether they're going to be with no, Lillian? No, no. You know, you know how loud they're going to laugh. Oh, so you know how the, how they're, whether the play is resonating with them. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. It doesn't mean, by the way, that at the end they aren't in the same place. It just means that in the beginning you go, hmm, oh, this is, this is, this is a fantastic night, or hmm, they're going to have to work to get this audience. What did you learn in tryouts in San Diego? Oh, well, we made a lot of cuts. You did? Yeah. You made it shorter? Yeah. Sure. I mean, that's the great thing about that's being the idea out of town. Prior. You start yeah. at large and then you cut it and yeah. cut it and cut it and cut it and change it. Is it dramatically different other than short? It's tighter. And you figure that out by watching the audience reaction? Well, the audience reaction and your own reaction in that, in that there's a certain moment where you can feel that you, you may have made that point and you don't necessarily have to make it again. Or that a scene, you know, we dropped a scene, we dropped a song all sorts of things. Here is what I like about this, as I did in Copenhagen. It is two interesting people being depicted by two great actresses on stage, looking back at their life, talking about what it was, what was the essence of the way they saw each other. Roll tape. The only reason you're here is because of me. Oh, that's not true. Oh, what if it is? What if that light on your face is shining only because you're up here with me. Who are you anyway? Your what's her name who made the mistake of choosing Lillian Hellman for an enemy? You're that writer I sued because you were so mean. That's not why you sued me. You sued me for the fun of it. I do like a good time. <laughs> You sued me to bankrupt you. How could I have known you'd saved so little money? You sued me to give yourself something to live for. What theater? The Barrymore Theater. Barrymore Theater. Go see it. Um, it's great to see you. Thank you, Charlie. Congratulations. Thanks so much fun. Thanks. Oh, Nora Ephron, thank you for joining us. See you next time. You're at a play that you like. And, and you love to write. And I like to write, I do. And, and actually, for many years, the Actors Studio used to have a program for um, writers who were not necessarily playwrights, right. who could come week after week, and the idea was that maybe it would inspire you to write a play. So I went week after week, and it was, it was 
the opposite of that because week after week some playwright in the group would have a little table read of his play and then all the people there would trash it and Harold Brodkey do you remember no, Harold sure Brodkey you wanted to sue me and I did sue you that's where all this is leading. And I didn't have enough money to defend myself. But people gave it to you. People felt sorry for you and gave it to you. People who hated me gave it to you. People who hated you gave it to you because they hated me more. <laughs> Nora Ephron is here over the past decade. She has become one of the most influential women in Hollywood. She began her career as a journalist and an essayist. She then turned to screenwriting with such films as Heartburn and Silkwood. She wrote and directed the blockbuster film Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail. In December, she had a new title to her resume, Broadway Playwright. Her first play is called Imaginary Friends and focuses on the legendary feud between Mary McCarthy and Lillian Hellman. I am pleased to have her back at this table. Welcome. Thank you. Now, what brought you to do this? I mean, were you sitting at home saying, I've got nothing to do. Why don't I write a play? No, but I'd always wanted to write a play. I mean, who doesn't want to write a play? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> well, I just have always wanted to, but I and I because went because you are of New York, of well, because I love to go to plays and I love plays and I love how you feel when you're. Yeah. He was he was in the group and he always it did not matter what the play was about. He always accused the playwright of being anti-Semitic. <laughs> yes. So, I would go week after weekend, and I I kept thinking. I'm not getting an idea for a play, except that I did think maybe I could do a play that took place at the actor studio with a character not unlike Harold Brodkey in it, but that didn't get me too far. <laughs> yes. But the point a play is, about play. I have always wanted to write a play. I just didn't know if one was ever going to smack into me. But and did, did you at, at some point say, okay, I want to write a play. I've always wanted to write a play. I'm going to go in search of... No, what happened is that I got interested in writing about Mary McCarthy and Lillian Hellman and this devastating collision that happened to both of them at the end of each of their lives when Mary McCarthy famously went on the Dick Cavett show <laughs> yes. and said of Lillian Hellman, every word she writes is a lie, including and and the, which is, <laughs> yes. which is of course, one of the great, witty, vicious remarks ever uttered and for which Mary McCarthy almost literally paid with her life because Lillian Hellman sued her.